global surprises in 30 minutes. Why there should be more exclamation marks in this unique book. Writer, church pastor and Bible teacher Mike Beaumont explains all to David Tavener. Our focus in this conversation is on the healing snake. Now, not many people like snakes. <laughs> They're not the favourite of many people. They're certainly not the favourite of mine, David. That's one thing for sure. And the thought of a snake that heals, well, that's just remarkable. So you'll introduce a snake, no doubt, in a moment or two. But what's going on in the uh, in the storyline? OK, well, let's set this story into context. The Israelites have escaped from Egypt and the slavery where they have been bound. They've crossed the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses. They've headed south. They've seen God's provision, both in terms of his direction, leading them with that incredible GPS system of the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He's provided for them water and manna and quail. They've headed south to the bottom of the Sinai Peninsula. And there at Mount Sinai, God's constituted them as his people and given them his laws to live by, the Ten Commandments and the unpacking of those Ten Commandments in further laws. And then from Mount Sinai down in the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula, they've begun to swing to the northeast to make their way up towards the Promised Land, which involved them passing through two territories on its way. First of all, Edom, which was just at the end of the right-hand branch of the, the Red Sea, what we call the Gulf of Aqaba these days, and Moab above it. So we are now getting towards the end of the 40-year period that Israel spent in the wilderness. It took them about two years to travel from Egypt to Sinai and settle there and be given the laws. And then there's a further 38 years of journey on their way to the promised land. So the story that we're looking at today about this unusual healing snake is as they are heading towards the promised land, hoping to go around Edom so they don't have to pass through it. And it's on the way that we'll revisit a familiar theme of these years. In terms of the time scale, you said it would take them 38 years to get to the promised land. I mean, is that how long it would take anybody? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, far, far from it. It would have taken them a few weeks at most, maybe three months with that sort of size of people that we've talked about in the past two, two and a half million people. Why does it end up taking them so long? Because of a familiar theme that we've spoken about several times during this period of their history, grumbling, discontent, not trusting God. And as a result of that, God had said to them that because of that grumbling, that those who had grumbled would not be able to enter the promised land. We find this back in Numbers chapter 14, where there's yet more grumbling that led to an actual rebellion of the people against Moses and Aaron. And so God had said these words to them, in this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old and more, who was counted in the census and who's grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun, as your children that you said would be taken for plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land that you've rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. So in other words, all the adults, all those over 20, are not going to enter the promised land. So God then leads them for 38 years wandering around in the desert until that adult generation that had left Egypt has actually died in the desert and only a new generation is left behind. So that's a pretty strong challenge there about the dangers of, of grumbling, isn't it? I was going to say, does that have an application for us today in the sense of can our grumbling hold us back from God's promises? Well, I think it can. I mean, praise God, God is always bigger than us and can always break through and do what he likes. But the 
repeated lessons that we see in the books of Exodus and Numbers that chart this journey from Egypt to the promised land is that while God is gracious many, many times with their grumbling, while he sees what it comes from, perhaps the fear and the anxiety of living that desert life and does graciously provide for them, as we saw in a previous episode, the point comes when God says enough is enough. And when God says, I can't do anything with the people who are grumbling to this degree. And the grumbling, remember, became rebellion. They were talking about stoning Moses and Aaron, getting rid of them, appointing a new leader, even going back to Egypt. Oh, that old theme again. Life was better as we used to live it. So it wasn't just grumpiness. It was contempt. Oh, absolutely. And of course, the contempt for God's appointed leaders were really contempt for God himself. You know, I think we all have the odd grumbly day, don't we? But grumbling can be very dangerous, you know, and I don't want to be too lighthearted about it. And it was incredibly dangerous for these people. It kept them from the promise of God. It kept a whole generation from the promise of God. And, you know, I think for us today, that needs to be a challenge. We can't just pass this off as a story in history. And we need to ask ourselves at times, have I so got myself into a position where my grumbling and my attitudes and my negativity about people, individuals, the church leaders, whatever it might be? And listen, there's always a place for bringing right concerns in a right way. Of course there is. But sometimes we can just get into grumbling if things don't go our way or they don't dot our I's and cross our T's. And this whole story, I think, shows us it can be really dangerous. It can stop us coming into what God has for us. Because the most important thing to God, the Bible shows us again and again, is not so much our actions as our attitudes. It's our heart that God is looking for. And if our heart is one of negativity and grumbling and undermining then how on earth can God build his kingdom on a foundation like that? He simply can't. So where does this healing snake fit into the picture? Aha, it fits in into what we've just been talking about, yet another batch of grumbling. And I suppose the first surprise in this story for the Israelites is the fact that nothing escapes God's notice. Of course, it doesn't escape his notice. He's God, isn't he? And he hears their grumbling. Let's just read a few verses from uh, Numbers 20 and uh, verse 4. So as the people are traveling around Edom, the people grew impatient on the way. Oh, that's an interesting theme again, isn't it? It's very easy for us to become impatient in life, impatient that God's not doing things fast enough, impatient with our leaders. They spoke against God and against Moses. Uh Uh-oh, that doesn't look good, does it? And said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. Now, hang on. They really are rewriting history. Again, why did you bring us out of Egypt? Life was better there. No, it wasn't. There is no bread. Yes, there is. Every day, God is providing it for you. There is no water. Yes, it is. God is miraculously providing along the way. Oh, my goodness. And the next verse, there is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. My goodness. What a way to talk about God's provision. They're talking here about what we saw in the previous episode that bread from heaven, the manna that miraculously appeared each day, six days of each week, double amount on the sixth day so you could keep some for the Sabbath. Why would they be detesting it? It was providing food and obviously water too. Well, what we saw uh, in a previous episode is that they, they get to the point of, I think they get fed up of the same old thing, same old, same old. You know, they've boiled manna, fried manna, stewed manna, baked manna, double-baked manner. Just uh, bored. They got bored. And that is such a key word, I think, that you've chosen there, David, because it is easy for us to get bored with our relationship with God, with our church life, with our 
home group. Now, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful to the Lord in any way in saying that there is nothing about him that is boring. This is about us. This is about our attitude. So, yes, they got bored with the same old thing. But what a what a challenge that is to us today. Now, if there are things wrong, yes, we can bring things to our leader's attention or whatever it might be. But this incessant moaning, which is really contempt rather than an honest bringing of our feelings to God, was really nothing other than, than boredom. And I think it's very easy for us today to to get bored. In fact, I wonder how many of us have said ever in our life, oh, I'm finding prayer really boring. My goodness, if we're finding talking to the creator of the universe boring, it's not that he's boring. There's something wrong in how we're praying. Pray differently. Pray at a different time. Pray in a different way. Instead of sitting at home, go out for a walk and pray. Pray about what you see all around you. Find a different way. Because, yeah, I understand Sheer routine can get difficult. Some people love routine. There are some people who love praying the same prayers day after day at the same time. There are some church traditions that delight in doing that and getting much out of it. Lots of us can get bored when we're praying. Well, go and pray a different way. Getting bored with church? My goodness, what is it about our heart and our attitude if we're getting bored with the things of God? So getting bored with God's provision is is a really dangerous thing. And certainly them getting bored here led to more than boredom. It led to outright grumbling against Moses and Aaron and God. And so that met with the judgment of God because they were really rejecting God's grace. I was going to say, in the light of what you said, you'd think that God has got a lot of patience with his people. Oh, my goodness. I think we see God's patience again and again in this story. But eventually, you know, even, even God's patience runs thin. The wonderful thing about it, though, in this story is we see him responding not by saying, Oh, my goodness, what a miserable bunch this is. Do you know what? I'm just going to wipe them all out, except Moses, Aaron and his family, and let's start again, like he had done in the time of Noah. So what we're about to see is an expression of God's judgment, but actually it's also an expression of his grace, because total judgment would have been to wipe them off the face of the earth. No, he doesn't do that. He does judge sin. By the way, that is a repeated theme of Scripture, that sin is ultimately judged. God just doesn't say, oh, well, there, there, never mind. We'll overlook it. And God judges sin here through what will lead us into our theme. He he judges sin through a a plague of of poisonous snakes. We read in verse 6, then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. Nasty. Oh, my goodness, nasty. Do you know, one of the worst things I have ever seen is one of the BBC wildlife programs that David Attenborough so brilliantly narrates, where there's some little creature running across rocks, and suddenly a snake comes out of a crack, and before you know it, There are dozens and dozens and then hundreds and thousands. They're all slithering all over. And I look at that and they're all chasing this poor little thing who actually does get away. Hooray. Um, But when I look at that, I think, oh, that makes my flesh creep. Now imagine that happening in the middle of your camp because that's what we're talking about, not just one or two snakes coming along. but People would be running for their life. Oh, they would. But where do you run to? Where do you run to? when you've got so many surrounding you and some couldn't get away. They ran for their life, but lost their life. We read that many Israelites died. Now that is the judgment of God, but it is not meant to be the end of the story. God is doing this as a, well, I often call God's judgment a wake-up call. It's, It's a wake up call. For me, things like the epidemic that we've had globally of COVID-19 I've often been asked by people, do you think this is the judgment of God on the world? Well, do you know, it may be, but 
the words I prefer to use is it's certainly whether it's a judgment or not, I don't know. But what I do know is it's a wake up call from God to us to live differently. The incredible floods and fires that we've had in the world is a wake up call from God to live differently. And these snakes, yeah, do come as God's judgment, but they are with grace. It's it's a wake up call. And that's what the people eventually realized because we read that the people came to Moses and said, we sinned. Aha. That's what God's looking for. Confession. Quick confession. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And as he prays, God comes up with his surprising solution. This is the healing snake. It certainly is. Let's read what it says. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. When you say make a snake, out of what? Oh, he had to make it out of the materials that they had. Remember, they'd been given gifts by the Egyptians, as we've referred to in a previous episode, when they left And so he took some of those. The next verse actually tells us he made it of bronze and put it up on a pole. So he took some of the bronze plates and bowls and things that the Egyptians had given them as gifts when they'd left, uh, had beaten it into the shape of a snake and had put it up there on a pole. I've often thought, I wonder what Moses actually felt. You know, there must be time and time again when Moses thought, Lord, are you sure? (laughs) Because, I mean, God asked him to do some crazy things at times, didn't he? Hold his staff out over a sea and it would part, strike a rock and water would come out of it. Here's my solution for too many snakes, Moses. Make a snake. Make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole and whoever looks up to this pole will be healed. But Moses, bless him, he makes this bronze snake and we read that when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake he lived so god had a solution for their situation by the way god always has a solution for whatever situation we might find ourselves in today there might be some listeners who just feel themselves in an incredibly difficult solution maybe they feel surrounded by snakes as it were and can't get away listen god has a solution if he will bring the situation to him. It deserves an exclamation mark though this. So this is advice to the people to just look at the snake and they will be healed. It sounds preposterous. It does. And it's not just advice. Uh, it, it's command, isn't it? If you want to if you want to live, this is what you need to do. Now we need to make clear I think that this is not an example. Is this is not magic. It is not the snake, the bronze snake that heals them. What the snake is all about is about them expressing faith. It's about them being obedient to what God has called them to do. And faith, of course, is what God looks for again and again. This snake would become very, very well known in in Israelite history. In fact, some listeners might remember that Jesus himself referred to it in John's gospel where he says, just as Moses lifted up a bronze serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man will be lifted up, that whoever looks upon him would be saved and uses that as a parallel. So this was not about the snake saving them. This was about their faith in God saving them. Will you do what God has told you to do? Still the same thing today. Will you do what God has told you to do for salvation? Will you look to Jesus, the one who was hung on the cross? Now, at one level, we might think, but that's crazy. How how can one man dying on a cross save me, put me in a right relationship with God? Well, at one level, it does sound crazy, but that's what God has told you to do. And that is what will save you. There is a reason for it, of course, because the man who died there, was no one other than the son of God himself who was carrying the price of your sins, paying your debt before God so that you could be forgiven 
as you put your trust in Jesus. So it's not about the snake in itself. The surprise is it's not really the snake. It's the faith. It's the looking at the snake that was the important thing. Sadly, some people will forget that. And this bronze snake would would become almost a bit of a totem, if I can call it that. We know that it was preserved, kept, and it was eventually erected in the temple. Many years later, we get a reference to it. Now, at the time when it was erected there, it was probably put there you know, as a reminder of this incident, perhaps as an encouragement to people who'd come to the temple to seek God for their healing. Sadly, it became an object of idolatry. Uh, in 2 Kings 18, we discover that in Israel's later history, it, it even acquired a name, Nehushtan. Well, that's not in this story, is it? But it was given a name eventually. And it was only eventually destroyed by uh, the very godly King Hezekiah, who was a great reforming king who purged the temple and religion of some of its idolatrous practices. And he broke it to pieces in 729 BC. But Wow, you were looking at almost 700 years that snake survived and was revered. Perhaps a bit of a warning to us there today that it is easy for things, objects, events that God has used in the past to take on a, a disproportionate place in the present and for them to to almost become idolatrous, to become something in their own right. For many, many years, I used to visit India and have many friends there still, worked with many churches over many years. And one of those groups was a group of South Indian Pentecostals, which is a, a large denomination, particularly in the southern state of Kerala, and they started out as a renewal movement. And one of the things they wanted to do as a renewal movement in the early 1900s when they were founded was to make a stand against the worldliness that was creeping into the church around them. Now, in India still today, fine clothes and fine gold are big things. You measure your wealth with how much gold you wear and the fine clothes that you wear. And so the Pentecostals decided, you know what? We, we don't need to live like that. We're not going to wear gold in the way that most of our fellow country men and country women do. And often they can be huge bracelets and jewellery and, jewelry and, and earrings and things. Thousands and thousands of pounds spent on these things. They said, no, we're not going to wear jewellery. And you know what? We're not going to wear fine clothing. In fact, I'll tell you what, we'll wear the simplest of clothing. And the simplest of clothing in those days was simply white cotton. So obviously cotton was uh, produced there. So they acquired this tradition of wearing simple clothing in white cotton without jewellery as a way of saying we want to live differently. Wind the clock on to the present day. And sadly for many, that has now become a snake in the desert, a Nehushtan, where if you don't wear a white shirt you are not truly godly. If you happened to wear a gold watch, you are not really godly. I forgot to take off my gold wedding ring on one occasion when I was speaking at a huge conference of 3,000 people there and got told off at the end by one of the denominational leaders for wearing gold. Now, actually, I used to normally remove it just really out of a mark of respect for them. I'd simply forgotten on that day and although people got saved and healed in that meeting, what was far more important was the fact that I was wearing my gold ring. Now, please, I am not digging at that denomination because I could probably tell similar stories about every other one, including the family that I'm part of too, church-wise. So it's not a dig. It's an example of how easy it is for us today to take things that were precious in the past a hymn book, certain hymns, a certain format of doing church, what we remember from Wesley's day or the charismatic renewal days or the Hillsong days or whatever it might be, 
and get stuck at that and become idolatrous so that what was meant here as an object of salvation in this story ended up becoming an object of worship. And God really doesn't like sharing his worship with anyone or anything. I was struck when you said just now that Jesus referred to this bronze snake himself in John's Gospel. I think, is it John chapter 3, verse 14? Now, John chapter 3, verse 16 is, I think, a fairly famous verse. I wonder whether there's uh, anything we can learn about the connection between those verses. Yes, absolutely. This was an incident that Jesus himself refers to, as you say rightly, in, in John three, fourteen, where he says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the ma- Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And then that really well-known verse to many Christians, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus here, reminding his Jewish listeners of that really well-known story. Do you remember Do you remember how Moses had to lift up that serpent and everybody who looked at him was saved and they all said, oh yeah, yeah, we remember that story. Well, that's what God is going to do with his favorite title for himself, the Son of Man. God is going to lift me up on a cross so that whoever looks to me, whoever puts their faith in me, just like they had to put their faith in what Moses had done, will not die like those Israelites did who wouldn't do it, but will have life, will have everlasting life. So it's a powerful image to a people who was steeped in this story, who knew it well. And here is Jesus picking it up and using it of himself and saying, just as that snake was lifted up, I'm going to be lifted up. And of course he was, he would be nailed to that cruel cross, but he would be nailed there, not by the Jewish religious leaders or the Romans. He would be nailed there ultimately by our sin That's the price he was paying. And here's the glorious good news that just as those Israelites were saved from their snake bites by expressing faith in believing in what Moses had done there, so whoever puts their trust in Jesus can know that they are saved. And even today, if someone's listening to our broadcast and our podcast that doesn't yet know Jesus, even today, just by coming to God and saying, I believe you sent your son to die for me on the cross. I am going to put my faith and trust in him. Today, you can begin a brand new life, just like those Israelites in the desert started a brand new life once they had looked to the cross. And what a new life that is. You've been listening to Mike Beaumont in conversation with David Tavner. Bible Surprises in 30 Minutes is a United Christian Broadcasters production. For more about UCB, go to ucb.co.uk.